I, I, in all seriousness, I mean, I've kind of grown up with this face and it's been in the industry for 10 years and now it's getting on these hottie lists. I just kind of go, well, it doesn't make any sense because <laughs> I was nowhere near the thousandth hottest face uh, when I started out. So I know, it's, I know a lot of it's projection, which is, which is kind of flattering about the work, I suppose. I think just to begin with, uh, I'm curious, do you remember the first time you acted in any capacity, even just fun around the house or something? And then was there a moment or an incident or something after which you knew that this was what you were going to do with your life? I think anyone who's been the mother of children should really answer that question. Um, I probably acted up when I was very, very young and too young to remember. But um, as far as doing stuff at school, I think my first memory was being a town crier in a weird sort of fairy tale fantasy and I, I, I remember I, one of the reasons I remember is there was a video of it and I, um, I came on the middle of the stage and clashed these big symbols and sort of announced very proudly what was about to happen or that part of the story just sort of moving the narrative on <laughs> but when I watched it back at the video I just I did that and then I stopped in the middle of the stage whilst the other people were coming on and just turned around and looked at it <laughs> instead of getting off stage but um, I think my early acting memory is probably that and I remember it being a big hall I can't remember where it was but it felt big and quite scary so yeah, I think that's honestly my first memory. Although I, I'm often reminded of a time when I was on, in a nursery play and I played Joseph and apparently, <laughs> apparently, I mean, you saw a lot of clips of me getting very angry. So maybe that was a seed for it. Cause apparently I, I pushed Mary off stage <laughs> cause she was taking too long. <laughs> <laughs> Which, and then uh, well, uh, poor Mary, whoever it was, I, everyone laughed. I mean, it's terrible. Um, I haven't not done that to a, a leading lady since. Uh, <laughs> well, Kira may be a bit in, in the imitation game, but, you know, no, I'm joking. Well, you know, people may or may not know that you went and got a master's degree at, uh, at the Professional Theatre of the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. I just uh, wonder if you can talk about um, what what the biggest takeaway from that was. And also I know, uh, you know, often actors are asked to describe their method or their technique, their approach. Um, and I know that you have a, a, a opinion about this, which was um, interesting, interestingly reinforced by one of your co-stars. So I would just like to ask you about that. Um, I mean, I, 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 I try not to go in with one specific technique because every job is, is so unique and it's different requirements. So. Um, there's a focus and there's an understanding and approach to work which is sort of universal. And there, there are givens. There are, you know, there are, there are certain parameters you have to work in as an actor. Um, um, sometimes they're the hardest to maintain. Timekeeping is one of them, and I'm, I'm notoriously bad at that. Um, and learning your lines. And I'm all right at that at times, and sometimes it can get overwhelming, with especially that clip you saw at the end. Uh, with that character, he's quite verbatious. So um, <laughs> there are good days and bad days. But... Yeah, I would say that it's just, I've always felt instinctively that it would limit the range of the work that you are capable of doing if you had one method that you imposed on everybody else that you're collaborating with. And so, obviously, as a student, actually, first, I got my MA at Manchester, I think it's an MA at Lambda as well, but I'm not sure, it was really a postgraduate one-year course, so I'm not even sure I got an MA there. I think that was more to do with Manchester, where I did three years of drama. Um, and an awful lot of plays, an awful lot of acting, but um, an awful lot of other things around that which fed into the acting. And I think that started my kind of understanding that it's part of a total art form. It's not just something in isolation because I was studying, I don't know, everything from sort of post uh, World War II American theater to um, drama as therapy in prisons and probation to writing courses to uh, sort of early Russian revolutionary cinema, uh, I mean, Russian revolution cinema. Um, and it just gave me appreciation of context. And I think from that, it gave me an appreciation of what the duty is to kind of, and also the enjoyment of further education as an actor to, to further research your role. So I went into drama school with that. And, um, and of course, uh, Lambda, like many drama schools, there are various approaches, very much you know, the inside out or the outside in. But for the first time, I realized after maybe, I don't know, um, uh, maybe 10 years or something uh, of, of playing all sorts of different roles, especially after my voice finally broke when I was about, I don't know, 22. <laughs> uh, uh, I played a lot of girls when I was younger. I played Rosalind and uh, Kate. And, oh, no, I never played Kate and Timmy this year. I played Petruchio, but um, who else did I play? Um, Titania and Queen of the Fairies. That was my debut <laughs> at the all boys boarding school I went to. Um, but I, uh, I, I realized that um, 
I had to be a version of myself. And you can never fully escape yourself. You're always partly there. Of course you are, and you're in the limits of your own body to an extent. So it's about it's about understanding that you can do the hat box stuff. You can have great fun doing everything from playing crap in Crap's Last Tape, age 22, to Arthur, uh, Willie Loman, rather, in, in uh, Death of a Salesman at 17, to Rosalind, aged 15, literally two years before. Um, and, uh, and have fun with that, you know, really, really kind of diversify what you, what you want to try and tr change yourself into. But drama school taught me about just being still and centered and having a very kind of um, measured approach to text to not jump the gun, to sit in the words for longer, not not jump to uh, intuition all the time, or at least if you had that first instinct that you could then work a long way around it to come back full circle to that initial feeling of understanding a character or a moment or an objective or an obstacle to overcome. And it employed that language, so you know, it's all this stuff you get on acting page one. And uh, and that was really useful, just to, just to put the brakes on and just evaluate where I was with that, my real understanding of it and not just skim over it, which obviously I think I probably had done a lot at school. Um, and have you, when you've worked with various interesting I don't know, he's trying, to, he's trying to get me to say, when I work with Meryl Streep, <laughs> first bit of name dropping of the evening, but um, I, yeah, she, I, you know, she and I had this conversation because I was watching her bring Vi Wesson to life and I was going, how the fuck is she doing that? <laughs> she's, playing, she's playing grief, she's playing esophageal cancer, she's playing the effects of the cancer drugs or not the drugs, she's playing the uppers and downers that she's taking. And she's playing uh, everything that's been boiling in her since a child, since an abused child, being an abused child. And uh, I just saw this actress at the height of her powers being able to play every single note of her character like uh, not even a, a, a conductor of an orchestra, but like she was literally running around and playing every instrument. And uh, it, it was really phenomenal. And I thought, how the hell did you begin? What, what, what was the first in? And does she, did she work from the outside in this one? And she, uh, we, anyway, we had a cigarette, it was election night, and we were chatting around the back, and I said, I've got to ask you, I, I'm just, it's wonderful watching you work. And how, how, did, how do you start? What, what did, do you have a base that you always build from? And she went, what do you mean, like a, a specific technique? Um, and I went, yeah. And she went, no, I think, I, you know, I think it changes all the time. Um, and I went, oh my God, thank God to, it's to, to hear someone say that, because that's, that's what I do, that's, that's what I'd always done. And, Simply for the reasons that I think it, it keeps you it keeps you able to adapt your craft to learn from those around you, and so yeah, there are some jobs that are much more like the method than others. I mean, I work with Katie Mitchell in the theatre, and she she provides such an intense process. You don't need to have gone to acting school in order to be able to um, be in one of her productions. She gives you such a kind of um, complex, multi multiple led, multiply led um, kind of focal point to, to hook your character on, whether it's the temperature of the room, whether it's the sound that the neighbor's dogs just made, whether it's the memory that the photograph that's not even on the set but that you've talked about in rehearsal is giving you as you look across the room to the counter, to the left, to the wife you're talking to, lying about the fact that you've been fired. I mean, just all this stuff to the point that we got to first night and uh, it was a real shock having an audience for a start. It was just like, what, you know, that happened. And I was like, why, why? that's not funny because in my mind, that's something very, very different. Um, and then once that was played in, it was it was wonderful. You just really had a not a disregard for the audience. Much much though she's criticised for that, it really isn't what she's about at all. She just builds a doll's house and lifts one of the walls off. And I, I've always I've always loved watching her work and um, thrilled to be a part of it. And I really, for the first time in my life, didn't fear um, judgment on the press night. I, I thought to hell with it. I've got. I've, and that's really what it all should be about. Anyway, you know, you, you should just be committing to the work and not worrying about the perception of it. You've made that compact with a director and your fellow actors, and it's about carrying that through. And it's not just about press night, it's about building to that last performance. Every day you, you're making new discoveries and moving it forwards um, within certain confines. You're a character, you've got certain tactics you can employ to overcome your obstacles, but you can't just suddenly bring in something you could do as another character. You can't just deduce the shit out of it like Sherlock if you're someone who has a little lower IQ and, and is not so um, kind of focused as that man is. And so, you know, I, it, that, that was extraordinary and I, and I took a lot from that. And uh, the seeds of that were in drama school, but um, beyond that, um, yeah, that was, that was the first real calling where I went, wow, I can, I can escape into something that's so focused that I sort of become um, lost in my task rather than self-conscious about what the effect of what I'm doing is gonna be on an audience. And in terms of just uh, 
on a day-to-day -day level, what do you feel brings out the best in you? Uh, would you be somebody who responds well to a lot of rehearsal or prefers not to? Would you be somebody who, on the, in the case of film or TV, you know, if you can, if you're asked to do many takes, is that something you appreciate? Or, you know, sometimes people say it maybe takes some of the spontaneity out of it. Where, where do you fall? I like on? doing a lot of takes. Yeah? I, yeah, I'm really bad at that. I'm really bad. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I do a lot of good takes. It just means I like doing a lot of right, takes. Right, right. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. And, and various rhythms come in with different characters and, and situations. You know, some directors have said your third's your best. First is the warm up, second, you're getting used to it. And the third you, you, you is good. And then everything else, you're trying to chase that third one. But I mean, on other, on other jobs, it's the 18th sometimes. <laughs> I can't remember what my record is. It's pretty, it's pretty heinous, whatever it is. Um, but um, it, uh, as far as rehearsal goes, to go back to the first part of the question, absolutely. I mean, when it comes to film and television, it's a luxury, especially television. Um, but it's sort of essential because you, you get to a point where you have some concrete grounding for what you're then stepping into. So you can tackle the day's work when there are going to be technical difficulties, uh, running out of time or light or cameras not working, or whatever it may be, then you're, you, when you have to just hit the ground running, have that in you. And also you can play, you can have fun, you can evolve it because you know you've got that kind of um, bedrock of preparation. And also that you're in collaboration with everyone else you're working with, you're not um, on a solo flight. And that's really rewarding. And again, I suppose that comes back slightly to method. I think if you're, for me, if I'm locked off doing my own thing, and there's certain days where you have to do that. The Brig scene in Star Trek, I just, I couldn't play scramble with friends with Zach and Chris. I had to go, now I'm gonna go into my corner and think about my shit and why that's more important than <laughs> their shit. I mean, no, no, we just, sorry. Wow, so articulate. Um, uh, but you know, it's that thing of just being in opposition to people. You can't, sometimes you have to build a little bit of a cocoon of concentration. Yeah. Um, the second of the third series of Sherlock, I have this massive monologue at the, in the wedding scene, and that was, uh, it, it's intercut with loads of flashbacks, but it's basically a sort of schizophrenic one-man show, and I, we did it for five days, so I really had to pull myself out of wow. uh, any kind of jollity, which, of which there was a lot. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, an awful lot. Um, it was great fun. They had a lot of fun without me. <laughs> so when you first entered the workforce as a professional actor, what sort of a career did you envision for yourself as far as balancing it or, or not balancing it between theater versus television versus film? And then can you take us back to the decision that came, I think maybe three, four years ago, where um, you were offered a, an opportunity to go to Broadway with a play that you'd already been a part of and made a very, it was a very difficult decision for you, but you elected not to do that because of sort of an idea of where you wanted to take things, so. It was a very selfish decision as well because it affected a lot of other people. I did do it eight months before we were supposed to go, but um, apologies to Nancy Carroll and Adrian Scarborough and Thea Sharik. I just wanted to mix it up all the time. I really wanted, I wanted to, I, I mean, my theater training at Lambda was, was a classical theater, classically English theater one year course and a postgraduate course, um, which I really enjoyed and got a lot out of, but you know, it was, that was it. That was the main focus because I thought, a little bit old fashioned in my kind of understanding of it. I thought that what I do, what the great actors that had been ahead of me had done and inspired me to do was the idea of starting out in the classics, then maybe a modern play or two, then a few roles in television, and then you know getting a film role, but keep going back to theater. And that, that is what I've done. That is kind of what I've tried to do. Um, the unhappy accident of that play being such a huge success was it came at a point where I thought, Christ, I've actually got some momentum in a medium where it's much more of a closed door. There's a very little uh, long-term memory. It's much more immediate. Your currency is something you really have to kind of work on in film um, quite fast to a, to a degree. I'm saying this in contradict. Everything I say tonight is contradictable. I know that, but it's just, <laughs> I guess that's what a personal conversation is really. It's just a point of view. But. Um, I, um, every time I say anything, I'm thinking, yeah, but the opposite is also very true. <laughs> um, that's the kind of, yeah, that's my head. You're getting into my head. Um, it's great being me. Um, so yeah, and I, uh, <laughs> I really, I was really lucky to have just had a few breaks, obviously with Sherlock, but also with Tinker Taylor, also with uh, Frankenstein and being cast in uh, War Horse. And that all came at the same kind of point where we were supposed to be coming here to do this Broadway production of After the Dance which might still happen, it might be a film, we don't know. It might, it's some, there might be some life left in it. It was a wonderful experience in London. But I felt that I'd had that experience there and selfishly I wanted 
to make some capital out of this momentum that was building. And I, I'm glad I did because I got Star Trek right. and 12 Years a Slave and Augusto Sage County. And um, yeah, it, wor it worked out well for me. But, um, and, and, and the Fifth Estate. So I, I kind of, um, I was very, uh, yeah, I took a gamble and it paid off. Um, yeah. Well, so that decision, as you say, led to all of these other uh, roles where that have only further raised your profile since then. And um, w one of the byproducts of that I, that I want to ask you about is clearly, uh, you know, you are now a considerably more famous person than you were at the beginning of this. And I wonder how that impacts you as an actor, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that part of what makes many actors great actors is the ability to kind of go out, observe other people behaving, as they as they do and channeling that and when you become quite famous i think that uh it maybe makes that blown yeah, yeah so well, i mean does that make your life harder as an actor there are ways of <laughs> there are ways of remaining disguised in plain sight as charlotte would say but you know and uh, to be honest um there are a lot of famous actors who are still doing great work so they're obviously managing to observe <laughs> something of of real life however bizarre theirs get but um yeah, of course, it was a concern in a sense, but um, what I value more than that is privacy. And I, 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 there are means and ways to extract yourself enough to be able to observe human nature and work through um, whatever medium of research or understanding of character or the human condition that it, it is you need to be able to get that. And surprisingly, you know, some of us do take public transport still. Um, I've got a motorbike as well, and I drive a car sometimes. But, I, you know, it's not, I'm not exclusive to the world of... Everybody else, but I know what you mean. It's it's now more about being conscious of this sort of thing. We're not having a private conversation. Um, I thought we were. Shit, the cameras <laughs> everywhere. But you know, it, it, that's weird. That is weird. And you know, you're constantly uh, at the kind of mercy of people who are basically with um, smartphones, walking publishers. So you kind of, you you, and being a performer, understanding what a camera is and what being observed is, I'm very highly attuned to that. So you're right to switch that focus back so that I'm the one doing the watching is 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 a, is a new craft for yeah. me. But I'm I'm managing it. Yeah. Um, and there are still corners of the world that don't know who the hell I am. So that's that's <laughs> always good. But um, there are also an incredibly supportive amount of people that, that, that recognize me but let me carry on my, my business. And uh, it's fine. It's just a sort of skill, I guess, to balance. And it's interesting. I mean, I've got friends here tonight, and you know, they've seen the sort of change where, by, you know, in, basically, and one of them said, Eloise said, you know, the other night, she said, unless I'm actually in my house with you, or you're in your house and I'm with you, I don't get you, because there's always, always going to be someone that wants to interact and have a conversation, or... <laughs> what has happened last night? We were in a restaurant, and this screen just got pushed aside, and there was a flash bulb going off in my face. And this was—I uh, was like, "Wow, that's that's a first. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, always lock the toilet door. That's yeah, right. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you should anyway. Yeah, that was. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, and um, I don't know. Yeah, I, it's weird. It is weird. It is. It is a. It's a. It's a learning process, and I'm in my infancy of it. But um, you know, I think some of it's helped by the fact it's happened in my mid to late 30s so you know there's a there's a sort of perspective which kind of gives an ability to breathe and try and extract yourself a little bit from the madness and say no and just learn that you know um you can politely decline something and, or just step back a little bit but also how to engage as well and I'm, I'm more comfortable in my own skin than i would have been had this happened 10 years ago without a doubt so in in that way it's a blessing um yeah so I don't know the exact chronological order of when you did these things, but in the past year, we have seen you, apart from Sherlock, in Fifth Estate, Hobbit, uh, 12 Years a Slave, August Osage County. Third season of Sherlock. Third, well, third season of Sherlock and Star Trek Into Darkness. And it's just, it's just unbelievable in one year. You can't, uh, clearly, it's hard to even uh, imagine how yeah. busy you must have been. And so I wonder, uh, you know, do you do anything specific between projects to sort of cleanse the palate in a way, or are, or are you able to jump from one thing into something completely different relatively seamlessly? Yeah, I, I formed a production company and did a short film. That was hardly cleansing the palate. But I, no, I, I do. I try to. I've been really fortunate, and it's a very high-class problem to have, but it is, it's increasingly difficult, and it's something I want to try and change in my work pattern, whereby you know, the last sort of two, two, I mean, this is a bumper crop of five months worth of film releases coming out from about one and a half years work. But in those one and a half and two years before, um, a lot of projects have dovetailed. And that's kind of, 
that always makes me anxious because and not not for fear of repetition, uh, although there is always that fear. But I ch I always choose one of the criteria anyway for for my choice of work is is to have variation, you know, selfishly just to keep myself amused and to stimulate myself in a different way. So even though I don't know, I had a bank holiday weekend between the end of the third series of Sherlock and Parade's End, and before Sherlock, I just I literally got off stage. Uh, um, uh, let me get this right. Yeah, I got off stage for on um, Frankenstein. I think I had about a week before we started filming Sherlock, and I was pretty damaged after Frankenstein. Both Johnny and I were pretty beat up. So, um, not ideal, but then very different characters, very very different characters, and it was really weird. This I literally was picked up in a car on our last night from the National Theatre, our after party. Got in a car, driven down to Stratfield Say where we were filming. I was on set on a horse charging with 80 other horses at sort of um, eight in the morning with Spielgo, Spielbo going, that was great, you want to do it again? That's great. Um, and just going, yeah, yeah, I think I do, just sort of slightly falling off my saddle. Um, but I mean, such a different kind of rush and, and experience to finishing a play to being on that kind of a set with live animals. I mean, you cannot compare the experiences. And it was like, what, after the what? What, what play was that, you know? Um, so it was... That's the most sort of intense turnaround I think I've had. Ideally, yeah, and I think it's important you should have, and I try now to have a shedding period of, of a bit of time, so I just get rid of the last one, start having some fun, then I just sort of center and go back to neutral and find out who I am. Friends and family are very handy for that, as is travel and just isolation from the madness of it all in any shape or form, and, uh, and then, yeah, start revving it up for the next one, just slowly cooking the reading and, thinking about what the challenges are going to be, speaking to people who know more about my character than I could ever possibly dream of knowing, and um, relying on the brilliance of the outside-in stuff, with it, whether it be wardrobe or hair and makeup, and, uh, and then obviously the collaboration all the way through that with the director in conversation, in person, and in rehearsal, hopefully, if there's time. That's the ideal that very rarely happens, but I mean, you know, it would be good. Uh, it happens every night again, but yeah. And particularly, I think, with, with you've played a number of people who were real, who are in many cases still alive, and um, you know, going back to uh, Stephen Hawking right through Julian Assange and, and others in between. I just wonder how, uh, you, from what I gather, you're a real you're a real researcher, real do a lot of preparation, and um, but yet in some cases you seem to have met with the person, in other cases you elected not to or you couldn't or whatever. Uh, just how do you approach it differently when it is somebody who uh, who is a real person? Most recently, Assange. Well, there are two things, I suppose, that are immediate and very obvious, which is that there's, there's a moral responsibility because that person in particular, his life is still uh, very much evolving. His situation is very precarious, and there's a responsibility to not do him an injustice, which a lot of his followers and him said that I did, but I was trying very hard not to, and my correspondence with him was to try and eek from him what I could bring to you know, work the part into something more empathetic. I wanted to meet him, not to study him, and then turn him into a two-dimensional um, arsehole. I wanted to make him somebody who's complex and human, and inspirational, and extraordinary and unique, and did, who's done something which is profoundly important for democracy. And I, I, believe, I believe he has, and hopefully some of that is reflected in the film. And I think people who are slightly more, you know, um, is partisan the right word? I mean, as in impartial is what I'm trying to say. Uh, did elect to say that it was that. And if, if, if anything, it was slightly more biased towards, towards his uh, point of view. Um, I don't think it was. I think it was fairly balanced. But I understand what his, I understood, I don't understand what his, his, his beef was with it, it, quite rightfully. You know, it was based on two poisonous accounts to his idea of what that story was uh, for his experience. And to him, it was something that was, yeah, absolutely antithetical to everything he tried to achieve, um, and uh, you know he he was dancing on the on the grave of uh, the box office flop that it it became. But I'm still really proud of it as a film, and I'm really proud of my work in it. And um, I'd stand by it. And if I was offered the part again tomorrow, I'd, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I mean, to try and justify, do justice to a man like that. Um, I think he's the only Australian I've met, or I've met, but had conversation with or heard opinions of that. Um, doesn't think the accent's good, every, or that I'm not like him. Every other Australian says I got it, but um, I you know, I, I, but, I, but seriously, I, you know, there's a real care of duty. And when it's slightly less, I mean, that was very complex because there was a morality that was very current, and it was so politicised. Every action of being involved with it was a political statement, as much as um, you know, he thought I was sort of 
working under the auspices of DreamWorks slash the State Department. I, I, you know, I, I, as a hired gun, I, I, I really, I contested that in, in quite a, quite a full email to him. But um, you know, I, I, I feel strongly as a, an actor that you should allow to, you should be allowed to try and dance with these very complex subject matters. And uh, it's tricky because. Most of the real people I've played are pretty extraordinary characters, whether it's Van Gogh, whether it's Stephen Hawking, whether it's um, um, Julian um, Turing now. Uh, Alan Turing recently. And you know, I, I can, you know, what, what all we do is 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 the most light, vague uh, interpretation or in, in impression of these people and their true depths and brilliance. And you know. The cinematic art form in itself is something that condenses years worth of experience and moments that stretch out into boring infinity into a eureka moment or a uh, you know a moment of high drama. Everything about it is is riddled with complexity because especially when it's r a real life, you think, well, God damn it, I know from my research and I know from talking to this person or from my reading that it didn't happen like this. And it raises a big question. It makes you go, well, why the hell are we doing anything about real people? But yet, we need some access, I think, some narrative access to understanding these extraordinary people in these extraordinary times. So I always look at it, and I, this is, I know this is a massive get out, but I do always look at, look at it as fictionalized truth. And I think most canny audiences know that. If they're gonna go to something which has as rich and complex a subject matter as, uh, well, yeah, the mathematics of Turing and code breaking or um, you know astrophysics and, and everything that Stephen's amazing at and, uh, and Julian and computer hacking programming slash WikiLeaks and everything that he did, you, you, you expect people to come to it with a certain degree of cynicism about, well, this is a film of this. And if I really want to find out about it, it's a conversation starter. It's not a fixed point to judge everyone by. Um, so there's that, there's that, there's that engagement. And then there is obviously the thing that these people do still exist and often, not all of them, but obviously, but yeah. not Van Gogh, but you know, there is a, there is an audience that already understands these people through a medium, whether it's biographies or articles or, um, uh, or documentary. So how do you bring about something that is both new and invigorating and different, but at the same time has an echo of something that has to be a reflection of these people? So that, that balance between interpretation and impersonation is kind of vital. Um, and yeah, having a really good hair and makeup team, <laughs> that's always helpful. A good script is also helpful. Good director is ultimately the most helpful thing you could ever have. Um, and I've been very blessed on that front. Well, those fronts. having spent the last uh, few weeks going over just about every interview you've done and all the profiles, I found that one of the adjectives oh, that's... Oh, you. <laughs> that's, that's a long week. No, well, it was... You, did, did you see your family? I mean, no. Do you have a family anymore? No, not anymore after that. No, 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 no. It was, it was actually very interesting because, you know, there are certain, obviously, recurring things that you say, but also that, that interviewers or profilers would say. And one of the things in terms of a, a complimentary adjective is that they, there's sort of a sense that you're timeless. There's something about you. You could have just as easily been dropped into a movie with Trevor Howard or, you know, Peter O'Toole or somebody as as you are today. And the blessing of having a weird face. A weird <laughs> Somewhere between an otter and something that people find vaguely attractive. <laughs> Or just an otter, which is vaguely attractive. Which is right, that's right. Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, you know, on these hottie lists, I just kind of go, well, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense because <laughs> I was nowhere near the thousandth hottest face uh, when I started out. So I know it's, I know a lot of it's projection, which is, which is kind of flattering about the work, I suppose. But what I'm saying all that for is, it, you know, I, I started out and went, yeah, no, you know, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a typical beauty. So basically, I've got a long neck and a long face. That's usually period. That's usually some kind of inbreeding weirdness. <laughs> so uh, I'll run with that. I'll wear some high collars and get on a horse or two. I'm fine with that, but not all the time. Not all the not time. Not all the time. Sometimes I'll just get a collar in a 21st century drama and turn it up, <laughs> as you'll notice I did in Sherlock. So uh, yeah, no, it's, I kind of, um, the, uh, the other world, I mean, I had a, a great, great English teacher called Martin Tyrrell, Oscar, you remember him. And uh, he said, um, it's weird, you remind me of William Blake. And I went, what? Uh, <laughs> the um, hallucinating visionary poet of the Romantic era? And he went, yeah, well, no, it's just you're quite an old soul. And I went, oh, I kind of, I kind of like that. And I, it kind of, an old soul. Did someone say what? <laughs> As in, not a, a new soul. An old soul, old smelly leather soul. And uh, I, kind of, I kind of ran with that because um, 
I was fortunate enough to grow up in England and you're surrounded by your heritage there. And it's a very deep, very long, very kind of old heritage. I mean, not my heritage, but like the heritage of the land and the culture. And I went to school where there were buildings that were 400 years old and those were the new ones, you know. Um, <laughs> it was kind of inspiring. And it meant that whatever I was doing in my context, in my time, I could always see what the past had evolved into and realize that we're not all that far away from that. We really aren't. And we, you know, it's important to be able to recognize it and to be able to honor it and, uh, and learn from it as well. And um, I can't remember your question. No, that was great, that was good, no. <laughs> it's very hot in here. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so another, another thing that I've, I sort of jumps out to me about your work, from Sherlock to Tinker Taylor. I mean, you've talked about with Tinker Taylor that it was a particular thrill to work with Gary Oldman as somebody who you'd really looked up to, but also um, sort of mask shifting, I think was the word you used, that anyone, any actor worth their salt would enjoy the opportunity to, to be putting on a variety yeah. of masks. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a gift. The idea of being a spy uh, for an actor is, is kind of a gift. I mean, I was half hoping I might get tapped on the shoulder by MI5 <laughs> or six or some, one of them. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> well, because seriously, I mean, it would be a great double bluff that there's a bit like Guy Burgess going around parties going, I'm a spy, and no one believed him, and of course he was. But um, it's kind of because we're so sort of, you know, showy offy as actors, so it'd be the worst kind of subterfuge. But the point is, but the point is, we shift masks. We, do, we kind of do that, you know, that's kind of what we do. It's part of our job. So the idea of playing someone in one moment, in one context, and being utterly different in the next, it's. Uh, it's meat and drink for an actor. Um, and to do that subtle amount of it, and also in Le Carre's brilliant world of extraordinary characters and a very real uh, Thomas Alfredson and what uh, created smoke and nicotine, that's the same, um, and alcohol, you know, just dank, gray, yellow, sort of bad, scraggly TV toned, ungraded film world that that film was. I mean, you could smell it. It was, it, it was, it was very visceral, that experience of stepping back into the past. Um, so, you know, it, it, felt, it felt that there was a contact with an emotional realism to spying, which is sort of, again, meat and drink, because it's more profoundly something that's recognizable, because they all have human stories. They have things to sacrifice, they all have loves or passions or um, uh, prerogatives and mo moral compromises and also the sheer boredom of it, the drudgery of it, the betrayal of it all. Um, these constantly shifting sands of loyalty and understanding and, uh, and diplomacy. And I, that, that, you know, that, that's, that's a very rich canvas for an actor to play with. So I, I, I was thrilled when I got cast in that. And with that company of actors, I mean, you, you, you'd have to you'd have to have done really badly to have done a bad job because it's just everywhere you look, you're being inspired, you know. Um, and, uh, and Gary in particular was just a, a, a joyous individual to work with and, you know, a man at the height of his game again, I think, in that film. Just incredible, incredible performance. So we talked about films about history or about moments in history. Then, you know, here's this... Here, com here someone comes along and says, Sherlock Holmes, which has probably been been made into more plays and, or I'm sorry, more shows or films than just about anything. Yeah, it's the most dramatized the character most... of all fictional time, I think. I mean, so to somebody says, let's let's do it again. We're gonna update it for the 21st century. Um, you know, was it immediately clear to you that this was something that was uh, that was worth getting involved with, or or when did it become clear to you that it would work? Uh, well, the sort of evolution was that I heard about it and thought, oh, uh, that sounds like an excuse to, you know, re-enfranchise something to make money. It could be a bit cheap and cheesy. And then I found out who was involved, and I thought, it's definitely not going to be cheap and cheesy. These guys are very good writers. I knew Stephen. My mum had done um, coupling um, a few episodes of that, Sarah Alexander's mum. And Mark Gatiss was a huge hero of mine as a student with League of Gentlemen. And I just, so I knew the stable was good, and I knew their involvement in Who, and I knew what they'd done with that. And... I thought, well, I got to read it, and I read it, and I completely fell in love with it. And then I went to meet them in uh, in a in a flat in Holland Park. Um, Sue Virtue's mother, Beryl Virtue. Um, once Sue Virtue was called Beryl Virtue's daughter, but now I think it's the other way around. She's so extraordinary. But they're both extraordinary. And Beryl is a massive titan of the industry. I'm sure she's done many of these conversations. Um, she's she is a legend, a legend. And I didn't, but I. I don't think I'd ever met her before. So she she came, and it was her flat. And I wasn't aware of it. I knew I was meeting Sue, Mark, and Stephen and to read for it, and uh, 
think one of the scenes I did was definitely the one in the first episode where I get John to come back to the flat and I've got, I just want him to type a text for me and I'm sort of uh, reposed with the steepled hands and and he's just disgusted that I've said it's urgent, it's important, can you make it? And uh, he just comes over and basically is a secretary for me um, with the, in the study of studying pink. And... Uh, and so I was doing the scene. And, as, and oh no, just before I remember Beryl coming in, she had tea and biscuits. And I sort of turned to Sue and I went, Is that, is that Mrs. Hansen? <laughs> and she went, No, that's my mother. <laughs> okay, it's a, not a good start. Not a good start at all. Okay. Forget that happened. Forget that happened. Start again. <laughs> Cancel and continue. And uh, I did. I, I, I made them laugh a bit and it seemed to go well. And you know, I, I knew Mark as well as an actor. We were in Start of a Ten together and we really got on. So it was fun, it was a lot of fun. And I thought, God, this could be great. I, I would really enjoy doing this. Just as I was getting on my scooter, I got a call from my agent saying they're really, 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 really keen for you to do this. And I put my helmet on, well, I finished the conversation first, otherwise that would have been painful. Um, and uh, I said, uh, Christ, this could be really exposing. And in a good way, but I thought this is really, this is a very iconic character. And whether it's good, bad or indifferent, it, there's gonna be a lot of focus on it as there always is with any incarnation of the great, great consulting detective. So I took a bit of a deep breath and I thought, do I want to do this? Is this the moment to do that? Because I kind of, you know, there'd been other things hovering around that I might have pursued or might have done. And I just went, no, no, I, I, I kind of want to carry on doing the work I'm doing, which is there, it's getting recognition, but it's, you know, it's just, it's leading to the next job, to the next job. And I was fine with that. I thought this is a really big sort of, step into the limelight, and then I thought, well, it's really good material, I'm gonna have fun doing it. We did the pilot, it was great, the BBC loved it, said one and a half hours, and then that was it. And uh, as far as the, the reach of this, I mean, I, I've read estimates, they initially thought maybe two, three million people are gonna watch this, it was like, the, they weren't, it blew away from almost the beginning uh, expectations as far as how many people cared about uh, what you were doing. Was that, was that very gratifying to see? Well, we were all around at Sue and Stevens, and uh, we watched it. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember if um, I don't think I don't think Martin was there at the time. I think he was doing a job, but we all watched it, and I I was really aware of this immediate audience response. I I don't engage with social media. I I, I have done a Reddit, but that's that was it, and I really enjoyed it. But uh, for other reasons we could talk about in a minute, that that would take over my life and probably ruin it. But um, <laughs> I was just amazed at how. Uh, vocal and immediate this response was. And it was it was pretty good. It was yeah. all very good, um, by and large, I think. I mean, they didn't read me any of the bad tweets. And so these tweetings and bloggings and just everything just came alive. There was a, it, and that's very rare to have a live experience with an audience when it's a television program. It's, it, it was a new experience for me. And I was literally half expecting to sort of, you know, walk uh, you know, outside to get the train back from Q and, and just uh, and, and see like banks of photographers or for news reporters to be abseiling from helicopters down and go, what, what is it like to be in the new hit show? <laughs> um, and uh, thank God that moment was delayed, but um, it was very overwhelming in a weirdly distancing kind of, or distanced kind of yeah. way, because obviously it wasn't in person, but um, we were very aware of it being a bit of a hit. Yeah, we were um, thrilled, thrilled, we still are. You talk about some roles being exposing, then there's another kind where uh, would be. I guess we would have to talk about The Hobbit with with Smog, where I think that there are um, some actors who are resistant to the idea of mocap technology. They say, you know, what's to stop them from just uh, sort of using CGI to replace all, you know, all of us? But uh, it sounds to me from from what I've read that it was a positive experience for you that you enjoyed it and and that you really dove into how you you know, into the process of actually being very, you know, the whole physicality of it all. So is that, uh, is that correct that it's something you actually got a kick out of? Yeah, I mean, you know, a huge part of what I enjoy as an actor is, is the craft of it. Um, the dance with the medium that you're working in, whether it's camera or stage, um, and the various different requirements that, that involves. And, you know, we evolved a lot of the language, the, v the visceral visual language with, with Paul and, um, uh, Steve, uh, the, f the first um, DOP on, on Sherlock, together, and it, it's it's a collaborative thing, and I, I really enjoy the technical side of what I do. I, I like to then, after rehearsing it and understanding it and, and getting something of a choreography of it, just lose myself in it and discover new things and probably fall into the camera or whatever, but you know, just move away from doing something precise and precious, but I do have an awareness of it. I mean, that's that's kind of what we do. I think anyone who doesn't completely, 
And there are, actually, no, that's, that's rubbish. There are, there are moments that I've had as well where it, the director wants you to just completely ignore what's happening with the camera and just be in isolation. Again, like Casey, just not know anything about what's happening beyond your experience of your immediate environment. That being the cutoff, if it's a stage or whatever the set is, if it's a camera. And at the same time, if you're doing stuff that's a little bit more technical, a little bit more visually flary, like Sherlock is, and, and obviously Star Trek, and, and very much Smaug, uh, in mocap, you kind of have to go the distance of understanding it in order not to hurt yourself, primarily. <laughs> um, and also just to make it work, make the shot work, make the moment work, and and then you can go back and you know step into something that's um, inhabited. And this was a completely new vernacular for me, and I didn't have Andy there to help me, although, as I joked, you've only done biped mammals, and now I've got to do a serpent uh, reptile, so you know, I, I don't know how your work <laughs> will translate into smaugging. Um, but, I mean, he is the king of it. He's the, he's the don of it. He's the pioneer of it, and he's the master of it. And why that man isn't just literally weighed under with Oscars is, uh, is, is, a, is a sad, um, I think, truth uh, of why it's not being recognized for what it is. It's the unloved child of cinema because it falls between SFX and um, animation. And yet it's such a visceral, live, performance-driven form of art, a form of uh, extrapolated cinematic art. It's something that, you know, green screen, you know, I understand Ian's grumbles about that. It's hard, it's really hard because you're continually projecting all of your performance to a ping pong ball and there's green screen and yet you are Gandalf. Um, and you know, you're in Gandalf's costume and you're doing Gandalf's voice, you've got Gandalf's makeup, you've got Gandalf's continuity, you've got Gandalf's lines. Well, you have <laughs> you have the lines that you're playing, or the character you're playing when you're when you're motion capturing, but you don't have the same context. You're in a room a little bit like this, in fact, very much like this, wood panelled. You've got infrared sensors all around the roof, the kind of cornicing of the roof. You've got this grey carpet. My God, I could actually do it now. Uh, I won't. Uh, and uh, you're just you're just free to position yourself into something. Which after you walk on set and you feel, I mean, most of you might have read me saying this before, but you feel very self-conscious because you're in an all-in-one gray suit and you've got little uh, reflectors all over you and your face is dotted in a sort of aboriginal uh, pattern of white dots which you have a, you have a, a cast which in my case was taken for Khan uh, and then that Khan cast was used for my face which was put on my head, holes drilled through it before it was put on my face that is and then these dots planted on it so that every facial movement was kind of corresponding with a coordinate which they then mapped in, which you get a lot of in the finished film. And you feel like a complete booby, you know? You just, you, uh, it's, it's embarrassing. You're kind of walking on going, hi, everybody. Um, I feel silly. And they're like, oh, Benedict, great. It's, uh, if you, do you want a coffee? I'll just sit down, we've got a chair over there. It's got, uh, it's got your character's name on it. Um, it's Smaug. Um, so yeah, Peter's gonna be down in a minute. So do you want a juice or do you want to you know, sit down and relax? I mean, we can, you know, we, we've done the range of motion. And that's the other thing, you do a range of motion exercise. So you kind of literally move your limbs, your arms, your head, whatever, limbs. That your arms are limbs, oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> you move your body to get like a full expression of what you might do in the space, the volume as they call it. And um, then you're on set being embarrassed. And then uh, Peter comes down, he's patting, you know, barefoot, going, oh, oh Benny, do you want, you want to talk about it? Or do you want to just um, do something? I mean, um, it'd be, um, uh, what, 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 what do you want to do? And uh, you go, well, I'll, 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 let's talk about it first, because I'm feeling a bit silly. Uh, can I take this helmet off that has a camera in front of my face? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever you want. Cool, okay, uh, so with this bit in the script, and then you work out the intentions and the actions and the shape of the scene and the character's motivation, it just all this, the page one acting shit, and then you get back up to being, you know, a fully kitted out booby, and um, uh, in my case, I'd, I'd done a little bit, the, the thing you said about research, so I'm jumping out of that question just for a bit, because I remember I didn't really answer that, I, it's a security blanket, not all of it, and very little of it ends up on screen often. And it's just to take a little bit more possession of the extraordinariness of some of the things I'm asked to do because it's so far removed from my experience. So it just gets me a little bit more, it, it just gives me a little bit more um, courage to pretend to be something I'm so far from. And so, for example, playing a far-breathing dragon of however many hundred feet who's ancient and lives in a pile of gold under a mountain in a kingdom of Erebor, uh, who breathes fire, uh, you know, that's, that, that's not my daily routine. So um, I, I went to the reptile house at London Zoo and I looked at um, lizards and Komodo dragons and I had some fun with that. And 
Uh, and then I tried to work that articulation into my body so that the, the, the boys and girls at Weta would have something to base my kind of physicality on when they extrapolated it into the extraordinary finished results you see. Um, they are the best in 48 frames in IMAX, I have to say, having seen it in both frame rates. That part of the frame rate thing is unequivocally brilliant, I think. Um, it, it feels like Martin's acting with a real live and a, a model, or at least, you know, at least a model, if not a real dragon. I mean, it's extraordinary. The seams, the seams between the real and the um, special effects are just, you cannot see it with that frame rate. It's incredible. Um, so I brought that work into this gray carpeted wooden walled room and thrashed myself about and did voice work. And I, I absolutely loved it. I felt like a kid again, you know? You feel free because you, you, you can only attempt to throw an imagination at that problem. You, you can't research that one. You can't read books about um, when I was a dragon, um, <laughs> uh, when I was a young dragon. Um, and you know, um, what happens when you get crazy with gold as a dragon, you know? You know. So um, I kind of, uh, yeah, I kind of just, um, I lost myself in it and I had a really good time. <laughs> Some of the awful photographs of me putting really quite terrifying faces on the internet have apparently shown, but you got to go the distance. Oh, and, uh, and I loved it. I really, really loved it. And, it, you know, I, I've done physical work before. I mean, Stephen Hawking and, and obviously Frankenstein as well. Um, and all my work, I try to, you know, we often get criticized as Western actors as being head down, uh, head up, sorry, you know. Uh, and even though our verbal culture is a very linguistic-based oral culture, very much about the text in England, uh, we do some great physical work. I mean, it's you know the land that Simon McBurney came from, to name but one, and DV8, and all sorts of extraordinary um, multidisciplinary kind of uh, theatre companies, as well as you know dance troops and everything else. So yeah, um, I, I love involving that aspect of it and uh, challenging my body as much as my head with what I do. So that's an experience where you're working basically in a room with with a you know a relatively small number of people I would imagine then you go is to any, a can I just interrupt sorry sure. is anyone else hot yeah i think it is can we can we turn up the aircon Luke? would that be possible someone's waving their hands but we're not getting a draft um, okay, so so there's that kind of an acting experience. Then there's then there's the theater. Yeah. And uh, you know, some it's it seems v almost invariably you hear actors say that no matter what the perks of or or pleasures of film or TV acting may be, there's something really special about going back to the theater. And yeah. that the only thing that they say maybe sometimes uh, you know you hear gripes about is that it it can become you know it, perhaps a tad monotonous. But for you. You guys with uh, with Frankenstein, with this alternating of roles and the way you approach it, I think it was uh, such a fascinating thing. And so just generally, theater acting, and particularly in that experience, is it something you, you enjoy a lot? Uh, very, very, very much. I mean, you know, um, I think the rehearsal process in theater is probably the most kind of privileged part of the whole experience of being an actor. It's wonderful. You, you, you have that wonderful sort of suspended time when it's just a room. There's no one judging you. I mean, you're working hard because you want to please your director, but you're you're with a company of actors and you're discovering each other and the world of the play and and how to, you know, bring off your part in it. And uh, that's that's it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's it's very cloistered. It's not what obviously it, it in the end is about. It's obviously about sharing that work, but um, which is always a painful birthing process, like that thing of having the womb-like experience of safety and security and compounding whatever the world of that the play is and whatever the requirements are, it's then <laughs> you've got to realize that you've got to then get on stage or get in front of a camera to perform it. And it was a joy because there were such extremely different characters, although obviously with thematic crossovers and reflections, the creator and the creation. So yeah, there was, there was a lot of stuff that, I mean, on some nights very early in previews, there were literal lines that were crossing over. <laughs> always on my part, I hasten to end, for Johnny's sake, he was pretty DLP. But um, yeah, no, I, 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 I love that, I really love that. And in fact, that was, a, that was a complete kind of condition of doing the job. I wanted to do it only if we did both roles, both yeah. parts, because yeah. it's unique and yeah, it's a hard, it's, a, it's the hardest thing about theater. It is so nourishing, like I said, because of the rehearsal room environment, but mainly because you have uh, an, an immediate idea of what it is that you're doing. But it, the real trick, and I think, again, it, it really I heart back to, well, the Frankenstein experience, but before that with Katie at the, the Royal Court, the trick of believing that you're doing something for the first time is a very, very hard one to achieve. Um, 
I mean, in all honesty, there are very rare moments in the third month of a run where you're not very conscious of your audience and the cough that just happened and what's going on in your belly and whether you act a little bit too soon to the performance tonight and what the hell am I going to do with the people that come see the play afterwards? And, you know, the, all these outside kind of voices because, you know, you it's so familiar. It's so familiar. It's very, very hard to trick yourself into unlearning the muscle memory. Um, and it's not like film whereby you can change your delivery. You can you can give a lot of choices in in, in, in multiple takes on on a film. So, uh, I, 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 some actors don't. I like to. I like to simply because it's such a rare and, and, and invigorating thing to be able to do. And that's why I like to mix it up because then when you go back to film, the things that are weird about film, like the early weird unsociable hours. Uh, Anyway. No continuity. Out oh, of order, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. All those, all those new problems um, are compensated by the fact that you get, and also not playing the whole character arc exactly. Like the continuity thing is a massive thing. You have to really jump in and know exactly where you are in your character storyline. But then you can change. You can you can give a different within the parameters, like I said earlier, of, of the tactics your character can employ to achieve his objectives through your understanding of the character and his limitations as well as his strengths or hers. You know, you can you can still have quite a broad canvas to shift things. You do in theater, but it's very hard to come in and do anything more than maybe five or six very different things. And also you don't want to throw the whole company. You can't go, guys, um, I know we're in the third month of this, but can we just rehearse that scene where I'm a little bit worried about it? And that's, that's hard, that's really hard. Because it is a job, and this is a job. What I do is a job. So you know, there are, there are moments when it becomes like a job, and you have to balance that with the craft and the art, but um, you know, it, I, I love it. I'm very lucky to be able to call what I love as an art a job. Well, before we close with this question from one of the thousands of people who submitted questions over Twitter, which you were nice enough to pick the uh, the, the winning question, uh, I just I have to exert a little editorial privilege and throw in one more because on. this was something that I know is very important to you and I think it deserves to be talked about, which is Parade's End, which was a... Uh, another great performance of yours, and particularly there's a scene where essentially you're having to bid farewell to or, or, or say that you don't love a person who you do love and, and do the honorable thing over the thing that might be uh, um, easier. And I just wonder if you can take us back to that moment because when somebody once well, before I, it, asked, it was it's slightly I think I think the scene I, I was referring to, if, if it's the same one, is the one in front of the fender. I think it's in episode two where he decides all the hypocrisy of this invented uh, department of strategy in the in the um, uh, civil service. Um, all the hypocrisy where he's trying to basically massage the message by faking figures through the brilliant mathematical mind that he is and uh, political mind that he is. He can't do it. He just keeps on saying, no, but this is the answer. And the war office is saying, no, but it can't be. You've got to make it work so that this is the answer. And he goes, well, just fuck off then, I'm gonna throw myself in front of the front line and I'm not gonna, I can't, I can't function the way I function. And he meets up with Valentine who is furious with him for underselling his ability and also for putting himself in harm's way because they haven't consumed what is clearly a blatantly very strong attraction. And she knows that he might well end his life on the Western Front and she thinks it's a waste, it's a waste of how he could be helping and he has to stand up for what he believes. And I, it's just, it's a profound, it's not, it's not, I, I'm very rarely happy with what I do. There's always something I could do better. It's not really that, it's not really going, oh yeah, I got that right. It's more, it's just more, bless you, it's more who that person is in that moment. And Tom hated it, Stoppard hated it. He was like, I don't know, I, I just feel it's too um, <laughs> on the nose. It's just, I, I don't like uh, it when Christopher has to explain who he is, which is what's brilliant about the rest of the adaptation. It's so, reliant on the idea that actors and directors understand subtext. Um, I could read the book for the most amazing subtext and profound insight, you know, inter internal monologues, you know, literally all streams of consciousness in this modernist novel to work their character into layers that you get a little boop, you know, kind of top mark of. And yet this is a moment where he goes, I stand for this, this is what I believe, this is what I hold true to. This, And I, I, I love that man, I really love that character and I loved what he had to say about what he felt England was and what he felt society and the duty you have within society, the respect of your elders and of your past as well as, as your present to you know obey and, and, and help those above and below your station in life. And you know he supports McMaster, who's a self-made man who's 
father was a, a shipping clerk in, in, in somewhere, I've forgotten the line, I think it's Liverpool, I don't know. But the point is, you know, he's not against meritocracy winning, he's not about a fixed social audit, but he's about wherever you are in that, at that given time, you better be good to those above and below you. And I, I, just, I just think they're very good principles. Um, yeah. Well, the last one before we liberate you is gonna come from Twitter, and this is <clears throat> from Naomi at Cumberbatch Web. And uh, I know. And Naomi's question was, Benedict, do you have a particular motto or creed by which you try to live your life? Well, I know I'm going to paraphrase this. It's a Sousa quote, and a, a fan actually sent me a, a card with it on the front recently, and it's it's something like, "Love as love as though you've never been hurt. Dance as though no one's watching you. Sing as though no one's listening." and live as though heaven is on earth. And I just think that's, that's great. That's about, that's about grabbing it all, enjoying it, and um, being profoundly lost in your, in your experience of living on this earth. No, it was embarrassing. It was like, I mean, if you can imagine at the time, I sort of, I'd say to my friends, I'm doing this film about a load of girls playing soccer, and it's called Bend It Like Beckham. And they were like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really uncool.